All right, thank you. Uh, as Tim said, my name is Erica Cosme. I am uh, uh, an employee here at the Mariners Museum in Park. Really excited about today's program, uh, especially with a lot of the things that we've been hearing in the news, but I won't get too far ahead of myself. Um, so with sea and space exploration, there is a lot of information out there and what we will discuss over this uh, next hour will only scratch the surface of that, but I'm really excited, like I said, to just kind of talk about these two areas. Um, oh, I think, let me see. Hang on one second. There we go. All right. <clears throat> So if you take a look at this picture, think on it for a second, a couple minutes, or uh, think about what you're seeing. What do you think is happening? Well, at first glance, it looks like a person underwater. You see a bunch of tubes attached to them, something that looks like an oxygen tank. So you think it's possibly somebody who's diving underwater. Well, you are correct. However, what you may not realize is that this is actually an astronaut. Uh, they are part of a training mission uh, at a place called the Aquarius Underwater Habitat. And this photo is from August, 2016. So this astronaut is actually experiencing some similar environments that they would experience when they go into space. And this is part of a deep space mission, possibly to Mars uh, within the next decade that they're preparing for. And the reason I kind of started with this image is to show that sea and space, although they're different, kind of have some similarities and oftentimes may work together to help understand a little bit more about each of the two environments, but our planet, our solar system and galaxy as a whole. So before we go too far into that, let's discuss exploration. So exploration, loosely defined, is traveling to or through a new or unfamiliar area in order to learn about it. Exploration is essentially at the foundation of everything we know today. Uh, much of the knowledge that we have, not just regarding sea and space, but our Earth, our planets, come from what explorers have done in years past. Um, and studying the deep seas or the oceans and our planets, the stars, the sun, and all of that, that's nothing new. People have been doing it for thousands of years. Um, and just a small note before I go further into the program, any of the items that you see with the little uh, kind of description at the bottom and a number are from our collection here at the Mariners Museum. So if you had any questions regarding those, that information is there. So there are many reasons why somebody may go out and explore. Sometimes you're just curious about the unknown. You want to understand a little bit more about it. Um, oftentimes, early explorers, when they would go out and travel and meet new people, they would trade items that one had that maybe the other didn't. And there was an exchange of not just goods and supplies, but ideas as well that was taking place. And as all of this was occurring, you were understanding and learning more about other cultures um, and different places and just those experiences as a whole. And then you have some people who just went out for the thrill of the adventure. I'm sure going into space itself is probably really exciting, although it can be a little scary, but those feelings mixed together is what makes it so unique and in some ways fun. And the information and stuff that's brought back from people who go out and explore, as I mentioned, is really behind a lot of what we know today. So we're gonna talk briefly about some of the history of sea and space exploration. There's a lot to it, but here's just a, an idea of when some of the, where we really kind of began a lot of this exploration a little more uh, deeply. So there are several organizations and institutions that work and research uh, our waters, our planets, space, and everything kind of in between. One you probably have heard of, it's called NASA, and that is the National Aeronautics Space Administration. It was founded in 1958, and part of their mission statement is to discover and expand knowledge for the benefit of humanity. 
Then we have the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, always a fun thing to say. They were founded in 1930 and part of their vision and mission statement is that they are committed to understanding not just our oceans, but their connections with Earth's atmosphere, land, ice, seafloor, and life overall. And then another organization here called NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That one came along a little later in 1970. And part of what they stand for is that they also want to understand more about our oceans and atmosphere through science, exploration, and discovery. Now, these are just three groups out of many out there who are dedicated to research science and understanding of our planet, the waters within them, and the space above us. However, um, these are just a couple I wanted to mention. And as a note, these are all United States organizations. There are dozens more of international countries that also do similar work. And most of the time, a lot of these organizations work with each other, combine research so that we can learn as much as possible as quickly as possible. So the Mariners Museum and Park, where I am today, is located in a place called Hampton Roads, Virginia, specifically a city called Newport News. Uh, and what's neat about that is that we are located right down the road from two pretty uh, familiar or maybe not familiar facilities, one being the NASA Langley Research Center. This one is in Hampton, so it's just a couple miles down the road. Uh, and what they do here is they research and try to advance a lot in aviation, aerodynamics, so a lot having to do with flying, getting to and from space, airplanes, crafts that do all of that. So it's really neat that we're not that far away from that. They also help develop technology and advancements for space exploration. And then we here at the Mariners Museum actually work very closely with a, 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 a portion of NOAA. The NOAA Monitor National Marine Sanctuary is actually right next door or right behind us technically here at the Mariners Museum and Park. And part of the reason we work so closely with them is that they work on a Civil War shipwreck called the USS Monitor that sank right off the Eastern seaboard back during the Civil War. And the objects and items that they bring up from the shipwreck actually come here to our museum where our conservation team performs work on them to get them back into better condition. And if and when that does happen for those items that are in well enough condition, they go on display here in our monitor center, which is one of the wings of our museum. Uh, so it's really neat just getting to have that aspect of it so close to us here. Uh, NOAA organizations, NASA, um, WHOI, all of these are scattered throughout the United States but uh, these are some local uh, branches that I wanted to talk about today. So the first person to ever go in space was actually a Russian astronaut or a cosmonaut as they call them in Russia. Yuri Gagarin was the first person in space on April 12th, 1961. And just about a month later, Alan Shepard became the first American in space. May 5th, 1961. And we just celebrated the, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry, I got ahead of myself. That's not the anniversary we just celebrated. This is the anniversary we just celebrated. Neil Armstrong becoming the first person to land on the moon, first American at that as well, July 20th, 1969. Back in July of last year, 2019, that was when we commemorated the uh, 50th anniversary of this event. Uh, and to anybody out there watching, I'm sure there are parents and grandparents who remember watching on their television or listening on the radio when Armstrong uh, stepped foot on the moon and made his famous speech of one small step for man, one giant leap for all mankind. And that is indeed still true today. Now, as I mentioned, we've been studying the stars for thousands of years. As long as we've been able to look up into the night sky, 
humans have been curious about what lies out there, how it all works. And we've been able to do that with advancements such as the telescope. But in 1990, the Hubble telescope was launched and this feat of engineering really was a breakthrough in our understanding of not just our solar system, but beyond. The Hubble telescope really gave scientists their first close-up looks at planets like Jupiter and Saturn shown here that are within our galaxy, the Milky Way, but it also allowed scientists to view galaxies light years away. For example, galaxy NGC 5643 on the left-hand side here is about 60 million light years away. As a note, I did try and calculate with some help from Google exactly how far away that is in miles. Uh, the number it gave me kind of kept going, 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 and going, and I wasn't exactly sure how to say it. So we will just um, go ahead and say it's really far away. But it was, as I said, a major breakthrough for scientists to really explore not just the elements in our galaxy, in our solar system, but to expand their knowledge uh, outside of that and really learn that there is more beyond what we know and that there's still a whole lot more for us to learn. Now, viewing space is a little easier. You, like I said, can look up, you can see the stars, you can sometimes see planet, you can, uh, planets, you can see the moon um, on clear nights. But seeing into the deep oceans has always been a little more difficult. Um, advancements have been made throughout history. One of the first really novelties that came along for deep sea diving uh, was made by John Ernest Williamson around 1913 to 1914. He created a diving bell that allowed the person inside to go underwater and take photographs below the earth, uh, below this, uh, excuse me, below the ocean's surface. So you still had to be attached to a ship. It provided things like oxygen and other functions so that the person inside could remain safe. But as you can see from the images on the right, this was just a novelty in us being able to learn and really look into what lies beneath the ocean. The farther down you go, the deeper it does get, so the harder it becomes to see. But we have made advancements in that aspect as well, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment. So a little more of a freeform way of going underwater came with the creation of diving suits. Here are some variations of what diving suits have looked like. Now the image on the far right in particular, that dive suit is made of metal looks a little robotic. Uh, they all look fairly bulky and, and they weren't necessarily easy to maneuver and move around in even underwater. You can look and see that there's a lot of tubes and hoses tied to them. Well, they were important because they were tethered to a ship above them that like that diving bell, it provided oxygen and all the necessary communications for the, the diver below to stay in touch with the people up on the surface. However, as I said, it's a little bulky, hard to move around in, and you were fairly limited in how much and how far out you could move around. You can only go so deep and you can only go so far out. Still a very useful invention, but again, had some limitations. Uh, during World War II, a Frenchman by the name of Jacques Cousteau allowed a little more mobility for divers to go and move underwater. He put on a, a mask and some rubber fins and dove into the water with his new invention that he called the aqua lung. Today, we refer to it a little bit more as scuba diving or scuba which stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And as I mentioned, what this allowed the diver to do is swim, ar swim around, swim about more freely without all of the, the tethers and the hoses and the tubes that were on the dive suits attached to ships above. You can 
now go about uh, and move around, not necessarily any deeper, you could go a little deeper, but again, it just allowed you to move more freely for a, a, an extended period of time while still breathing underwater. So the first person to go into space took place in 1961. However, a year before, on January 23rd, 1960, Don Walsh and Jacques Picard actually became the first people to descend down to the bottom of the ocean, the deepest part of the ocean known as Challenger Deep. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like later on in the program. But with their vessel called Trieste, they were able to venture down for the first time to the deepest parts of the ocean, really get an idea of how far down that is. It took them a little over four hours to descend what is about 35,000 plus feet. So again, making advancements, going a little further, this was done a year before, as I said, we went into space. So in this case, it looks like the, uh, our understanding of the ocean while it was still growing, uh, we were able to find out a little bit more about that aspect of our deep oceans at that time. The bottom right photo there is a model of Trieste we do have here at the Mariners Museum that is on display. Uh, if you ever come to visit us, you can absolutely come and see that one. It's one of my favorites actually. So there are some similarities, as I mentioned, a lot of differences as well, and in some ways, sea and space can intertwine. So we're gonna take a brief look at that over the next couple of slides here. First, one of the most interesting things I think I learned about when I was doing a lot of research for this is how cold or how not cold, so to speak, these two areas can get. So in space, depending on where you are, if the sun is on you, it can get extremely hot. But when you are typically in the shadows or the sun is not on you, it can get as cold as minus 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That is extremely cold. I don't think even the heaviest jacket would provide much warmth for you out there, but they do wear the proper gear and we'll talk a little bit about that. But what I found a little more interesting is that down in the deep sea, Challenger Deep, which is about seven miles down where little to no sunlight, actually no sunlight reaches, it only gets as cold as about 34 degrees. Scientists and researchers who have gone down to this part of the ocean have only measured it getting about that cold. That is still above freezing. Freezing on a Fahrenheit um, thermometer is at 32 degrees. So I was really surprised to learn that while it's still very cold, it's not as cold as I would have thought it'd be. But again, uh, you're not down there in just normal clothing. You're typically in a vessel. Uh, so all of that will, the vessel will provide the, the warmth and keep you, keep the pressure inside and everything that you need to stay safe. So who is actually going to these places? the people who are kind of doing the legwork. Of course, you have scientists and researchers who assist them on land or on ships at sea, but you have astronauts who are the ones trained to go into space, do the work out there. Um, usually they're trained to uh, fly the space shuttle that takes them out. It comes from ancient Greek where astro means star, and the not means sailor. So essentially a star sailor, if you wanna break it down that way, but an astronaut is essentially um, pretty much someone who is trained to fly spacecrafts and work in space often for long periods. And if you break down the term aquanaut, also from Greek, aqua means water and not again means sailor. So a water sailor or an underwater sailor. Um, they have a similar job to that of an astronaut where they go and work typically for extended periods of time underwater in underwater habitats. And they live there for several months, just like an astronaut would in space. So we've seen a couple astronauts 
let's take a look at what an aquanaut and some of these underwater habitats would look like. One important and fairly well-known aquanaut is Sylvia Earle. Um, she has done underwater research all across the globe, including in the Galapagos Islands down in South America, in parts of the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean over in Asia, and in China. Um, she is somebody who has also been affiliated with the NOAA organization uh, later on in her career. But one of the neat things about her is she kind of was one of the first women to do long-term research projects at a time when it was still really a man's job to do it, especially living out at sea on a boat for extended periods during the 60s and 70s when she was beginning her career. So she really made kind of, she was a pioneer for women uh, in this oceanographic uh, science research uh, area. And in 1970, she led the first all-female team of women in a deep sea project called Project Tektite. So Project Tektite took place in two different stages. Um, the first was an all-male crew. They lived underwater uh, for about two months at a time. And what's neat about the term tektite, this is one of those areas where sea kind of meets space again. Um, tektite is actually a type of natural glass that is formed when a meteorite lands and impacts in the earth. And because of that heat, if it hits certain rocks and other elements, it actually melts with them and forms this new element that is referred to as tektite. Another way C meets space in this project is that Project Tektite is funded by several organizations, but one of the main funders of it was actually NASA. So despite the fact that it was an underwater research study, NASA was still involved with this. So just one of those ways that I've mentioned that C and space can often intertwine. And it's very similar to the Aquarius habitat that I mentioned at the beginning, where you can study the physiology, the mental, the brain, the body, essentially, of somebody who's living in these harsh conditions for extended periods of time. So Project Tektite, the first part, as I mentioned, was a team of four men. Uh, they worked underwater for two months. They lived and studied the ocean life while they were down there. Uh, and then in 1970, with Project Tech Type 2, uh, was the first all-female team. Sylvia Earle is shown in this image on the right-hand side, pointed her out for you. And again, she was the leader for that project. So this was really an advancement, a pioneering effort uh, for women in this field. Uh, and because of this, they were more and more women were able to understand that they too could become scientists, do research, do basically a man's job. And from there, it's only grown. We've had more women going to the deep, going into space. And we'll look at one or two of those a little further into the program as well. So just some thoughts about this. You are living underwater in a fairly small space. You're living there, you're working there, you're sleeping there, you're eating there. This is your life for two months. You have little to no contact with anybody up above in the surface. And when you do, it's fairly limited in communication and it's oftentimes more so work related. So I just want you to think about the mindset that one would possibly go through in this type of place. Thinking about being away from your favorite food, your friends, your family for a long period underwater and being underwater can be just as harsh an environment as being in space. So this is what makes both uh, astronauts and aquanauts pretty impressive people. It's definitely not a job just for anybody. There's a lot of training, both mental and physical that goes into it, but what they bring back the knowledge through their research and everything from actually living in these environments has been 
extremely helpful in our understanding of both the deep sea and space and in some ways of our capability as humans to live in some of these places in the event that maybe one day we travel off the planet earth and live elsewhere so here's a side-by-side -side comparison of a dive suit in a space suit this is a I showed you the, space, uh, the dive suit earlier, but here's a spacesuit. And if you're thinking that they look fairly similar, you would be correct in your thought. Spacesuits are actually kind of modeled after these early dive suits, and they both provide similar functions. The person inside essentially is being kept as safe as possible from the elements of the deep sea below them and above them and around them and the different atmospheric changes that come from being in space. Um, they have mechanisms on them that provide oxygen as well so that they can breathe. Uh, and they can also communicate. There's communication, comms and everything in them so that they can stay in touch with their team. So the importance of wearing either one of these suits, depending on where you're going, is because the farther down you go underwater, there's more pressure. And as you go into space, there's less pressure. So what this means is that the farther down underwater you go, you've got the weight of all of the water on top of you pushing down. And when you're in space, with little to no pressure, unfortunately, should something malfunction with your spacesuit, or if you just decided to take a spacewalk without putting your suit on altogether, um, essentially your internal organs would implode. They would fill with too much air and explode or implode inside your body. Very dangerous, um, does not sound fun at all. So it, these suits are equally important. Uh, and for deep divers who have gone further down than the depths like the diver in this image on the left, they are in submersible vessels, which I will show you shortly here. And they kind of provide a similar function where they keep the pressure regulated inside the vehicle, much like the pressure is regulated here inside these suits. There's also communication systems and oxygen, which is very important to survive in any environment you're in, but especially to pretty intense ones like deep sea in space. <clears throat> So if you ever wanted to take a vacation into space or go down to the bottom of the ocean, um, I'm not sure we've gotten quite there yet, but never hurts to think about or be prepared of the type of experience you would have getting to either, uh, getting to either location. So you've got a space shuttle, which is designed to transport people and the supplies that they need. Uh, into space and also while they're working in space as well. Uh, then you have a submersible vessel like the Trieste, which I showed you earlier. Um, and this vessel or craft is designed to operate not just underwater, but in extreme deep. So both of these vessels will get you there, but they do them a little differently and the next couple of videos are gonna show you the differences on what that looks like. So first, we will take a look at a space shuttle here. This is the launching of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on May 11, 2009. Um, it was on its way to make repairs to the Hubble telescope. was a pretty noisy, loud, intense way of getting into space. 
getting to the bottom of the ocean is a little different, almost the exact opposite. Um, what you're looking at here is a ship getting ready to launch a remotely operated vehicle or ROV. This is a different type of submersible. Actually, no person is inside of it. It's completely controlled by uh, scientists and researchers on the ship who are controlling it, kind of like a, a very expensive video game. Um, while the Alvin submersible is underwater, they can take video, images, there's compartments um, where Alvin can collect things so that it can be brought back up for scientists to study, um, just to learn more about our deep ocean. So we just took a look at that space launch. Here's a comparison of a submersible being launched. differences between the two you may have noticed. Um, so the space shuttle launches at roughly 18,000 miles per hour. That is higher than any speed limit you will find in a car here on Earth. However, it's got to go against gravity to get all the way out of the Earth's atmosphere, which is about 62 miles. Um, so all of this takes place, it leaves the Earth's atmosphere in about eight and a half minutes. The submersible, on the other hand, uh, again, needs assistance usually from that crane that you saw from the boat or the ship that it was being lowered by. It travels downward at about four miles per hour. That is fairly slow considered to 18,000 miles per hour. It takes on average today about two and a half hours to get down to the bottom of the ocean. Again, when um, Don Wash and Picard did it, it took about four hours, uh, but as advancements have been made, that has actually, uh, the time has been sped up a little. And what's crazy about that is they're only going seven miles down. The Challenger Deep that I've mentioned is only seven miles uh, below sea level. So it takes a little longer to get there. You're going much slower, but there are things to think about that I've mentioned before as the pressure of the water going down. So if you've ever been in a swimming pool or anything like that and you kind of dive to the deep end or if you're a scuba diver, you've probably noticed your ears may pop a little um, from the pressure or actually feel clogged actually from the pressure of the water that's uh, surrounding you and pushing down on you. So you have to be able to go slow to maintain that pressure um, and keep, in some cases, when a person is inside, keep them safe, but keep the vehicle safe as well, even when nobody else is in there. <clears throat> so where's everybody going? When you leave the earth, uh, there are a couple different options as of now, we are working on other ones where humans can go, but we do have technology that has gone farther. So when the moon is at its farthest point from Earth, it is a little over 250,000 miles away. Uh, when a space shuttle launches and is trying to get to the moon, it will take about three days to get there. However, uh, they will typically stop first at a place called the International Space Station. So the space station usually takes about four hours to get there after being launched, and it sits about 250 miles above Earth. Uh, so the International Space Station is not just where astronauts can work and live, but it's also a laboratory where they can study some of the items that they've brought back in, if they've encountered anything like that. They also have to do spacewalks and do repairs to the exterior or outside of the station as space can have things that are launched at it like asteroids and it is a piece of technology, so things do break. 
but it's a pretty important piece of technology and living space. And this is where some of those elements from studying how people live underwater can then be translated to somebody living in space. Um, and then of course we have sent about 12 people to the moon. It's been a couple years since anybody has been there, but we are working on getting men and women back on the moon soon. Um, so again, the moon is a little over 250,000 miles away from us and it takes about three days to get there. Um, and then you've got the International Space Station where you will often dock in the meantime. But, oh, excuse me. So the farthest that anybody has gone in space, that record goes to the crew of Apollo 13. Um, they traveled 248,655 uh, miles away from Earth. They were initially supposed to land on the moon. Um, anybody who has seen or is familiar with the movie Apollo 13 uh, may remember that the ship malfunctioned and that actually occurred. There was an explosion on board and the men were for a period of time stranded out there. Uh, luckily, scientists both here on Earth in communication with the men in space were able to bring them home safely. Uh, but to this day, they do hold the record for making for the human, for a human, making it the farthest in space. And what's really neat about their official photo is that they are actually posing with two instruments that have been used in seafaring and navigation for hundreds of years. So the sextant and the astrolabe are instruments that were used in early uh, maritime navigation. And I think this is just a really neat way and neat example on, again, that sea meets space, the fact that they understand and recognize that studying the stars and looking to space and understanding our universe and everything that comes with that really began right here on land, came with a, a lot of information that we learned from early explorers who were traveling by sea. Um, and we here at the Mariners Museum talk a lot about seafaring and early navigation and have very many of these in our collection. And these are just a couple, um, an example of each, a sextant and an astrolabe that we here at the Mariners Museum have in our collection. So the Challenger Deep, I have mentioned a couple times. Um, let me get my. It is located in the Western Pacific Ocean, uh, kind of located around and near parts of Asia, including Japan, China, and Philippines. And it is situated at almost minus 36,000 feet below sea level. Um, so the curved portion, the crescent part that you see there, that is referred to as the Mariana Trench. It's also sometimes called the Marianas Trench, um, but typically scientists and researchers who explore this area do refer to it as the Mariana Trench. And then if you can kind of see down at the bottom, I have put a kind of dot where the Challenger Deep is. And this is officially where the currently known deepest part of the ocean exists. Um, so, so Challenger Deep, as I've mentioned, is about seven miles down. It was located uh, in the 1800s by a British vessel called the HMS Challenger, and that's where it gets its name from. Um, so the thing, one of the unique things about the Challenger Deep is that it is approximately, so I've mentioned it's 35,000, uh, a little more than 35,000 feet below sea level, excuse me while I get my numbers here. So to give you an idea of how deep that actually is, the tallest peak here on Earth is Mount Everest and that stands at approximately a little over 29,000 feet. So this means you can place Mount Everest uh, at the bottom of the ocean in the Challenger Deep and the peak of it would still be about 7,000 feet below the surface of the water. So it's 
pretty, it's a pretty deep spot. That's just a, a simple way of putting it. Um, and scientists are currently in the process of understanding and trying to learn as much about this area as possible. Um, it does have its challenges getting down there. As I've mentioned, one of them being it is extremely dark. Uh, so ensuring you have proper lighting, proper tools, and the proper vessel to get there are all very important. And some of the most diverse marine life that researchers and scientists have discovered actually live within this uh, region of the Mariana Trench um, and in the Challenger Deep. And the Earth's, uh, the Earth, excuse me, the ocean's bottom actually has a surface that looks very similar to a lot of the land masses that we do see on Earth. Um, you do have things like geysers, uh, and it's a very rocky, there's even small mountains and hills that are all underneath. The seafloor has been completely mapped, so as they kind of learn more about how it looks, they're able to now learn a little bit more about how life survives down there. So another example of sea and space intertwining uh, came fairly recently with former astronaut Catherine Sullivan. Uh, she became the first, women, uh, first woman back in October of 1984 to actually walk in space. Um, this, she did not go to the moon. She simply uh, worked on aspects of the International Space Station geared up in her spacesuit, as you see here in her official photo, and did repairs to the outside, studied aspects of space. Um, so that was a very big pioneering moment again for yet another woman. And then she went ahead and made history again by being the first woman down into the Challenger Deep just recently on June 7, 2020, so earlier this year. So here's a tweet from her, uh, 36 years after her spacewalk, becoming the first woman to dive to the deepest known spot in the ocean. And she describes her experience, these are her own words, that when you launch off the planet, it's an explosive, turbulent, massive amount of power. And when you go down into the deep of the ocean, it's a comparatively really serene experience. Um, so Thinking back to the videos that I showed you of the rocket launching off, thinking about how loud it was, how much it looked like it was shaking and how fast it propelled from Earth into the atmosphere. And then thinking about the submersible, how much slowly it takes to get to the bottom of the ocean, the things you probably get to see along the way as you're doing that two and a half hour descent. I think it's really neat hearing from an astronaut. Um, she's also a geologist. So just hearing her words, comparing those experiences really gives you an idea on how different these two places can be. And more importantly, how different it really is uh, to get to each of these places. She went on later, this is uh, from an interview from NPR. She went on to describe her experience down at the bottom of the ocean. Um, just again, comparing and contrasting the similarities of her being down in the, the deep darkness of the ocean compared to being up in space. So again, making history twice, very important milestone for Catherine Sullivan. So a lot of what I've talked about uh, are things that have already occurred, some of the history that has been made, some of the history in advancements and technology. Uh, here's what we kind of know already, but there's still plenty more to learn. Just recently, this past Sunday, uh, not sure if anybody watched the launch of the SpaceX uh, shuttle and rocket. Uh, it was a four-person team and they recently just landed at the International Space Station earlier this week. So what's really kind of interesting about this is the man in the photo on the far left, his name is Victor Glover, and he is making history as we speak. 
Now, he is not the first African American to go into space. That goes to Guyon Bluford, who was the first uh, African American to go into space on August 30th, 1983. And several other African American astronauts have gone since then. What is a standout moment for Victor Glover, however, is that he is the first astronaut, uh, first African American astronaut to live full time on the International Space Station. And just to clarify what that means, previous astronauts of African American descent were typically only on this International Space Station for short periods, upwards to maybe a couple weeks. Victor Glover is going to be there uh, for up to six months while they perform work on the station and continue just doing science and research into deep space and space exploration as a whole. So men and women are continuing to make not just history, but to open new doors. And as they're doing it on top of that, they're just including more to our understanding and knowledge of all of these spaces that make up our solar system and our planet and our oceans and waters and stuff. So I think it's really cool getting to read stories like Victor Glover, um, Catherine Sullivan, even Sylvia Earle, who was one of the first women to really do underwater research and lead an all-female team. Um, it's just another example on how there's still so much more to do and we're making it happen. And I think that's really cool. We are attempting at some point to go to Mars to possibly send human to Mars, but before we can do that, we need to understand more about the planet. Um, so launched July 30th this past year in 2020, the Perseverance rover, affectionately called Percy by NASA scientists, uh, was sent on its mission where it will spend the next several mo se seven months traveling um, throughout space where it will eventually land on Mars. Um, so it's making the journey to Mars. It's scheduled to land on February 18th, 2021. So mark your calendar. Um, and it's, it will seek signs of ancient life, collect rock and soil samples to be brought back to Earth to study more of Mars makeup and to understand more about the planet for, again, when, if that happens, we are able to send humans there. And NASA does have some really neat websites. I'm going to um, see, hopefully this pulls it up here for me. Um, but I've also included these link in a document at the end of the program here. But this link here actually lets you um, live track Percy's um, information. So let's see. So some of the things that you'll see on here is how far it's traveled from Earth, um, how fast it's going. It's a little more than halfway into its trip. And there's some additional information like facts, again, the landing date, um, where it will land on Mars, what it's designed to do once it's there, and a lot more information about the rover itself and then what will actually take place once it gets there. So I think that's a really neat um, tracking system if anybody's interested. The website on top here, um, also a NASA website, lets you look at our solar system makeup in live time. So over here, you can see there's Haley's Comet. You can go further into the solar system here, zoom out, doesn't look like it really wants to do it right now, but um, you can see just different aspects of our solar system, different objects, different man-made objects like the International Space Station, moons, planets, all of that. So I think those are some really useful tools that NASA has provided so that we can stay up to date with all of the really kind of cool things that they're doing and will continue to do. And as I mentioned, we are attempting to send humans back to the moon. Um, the plan is in 2024 through the Artemis program to send the first woman 
and a group of men to the moon. So they are already in training for that. And I hope to get to witness that in the next couple of years, if that gets to happen. So 2024, no official date yet on when that will take place. But again, just keep your eyes and ears open for information on that. So space, as we've seen, is pretty vast. We've seen there's other galaxies. The planets are all unique. Have we or will we discover alien life in space? Thus far, we have not proven any. We do not know if that will change. Um, but there are some other really neat aspects to not just our solar system and galaxy, but galaxies out there. But we don't know the answer to this yet. So we will have to stay tuned once again and see what happens as we continue exploring further into space. And in the deep oceans, we are continuing to explore down there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, from September through December of 2020, the exploration vehicle Nautilus here, that's the ship name, um, and the remote operated vehicle Hercules are working to understand more about the bottom of the ocean, more of the landscape, more of the uh, wildlife, plant life, and everything in between that lives down there. And a lot of their research will uh, kind of help us understand not more about that, but some of the things that they brought back up. Is there any possibility for medicine uh, that can come from any of the the plants and stuff that live down here. These are all things that they're thinking about in addition to just trying to understand and really explore more of what's down there. But one of the, what I say or feel is one of the coolest things I came across in my research is that sea and ocean, ex or I'm sorry, space and ocean exploration are kind of working together in a unique way. Uh, this image here shows you various moons of some of the planets in our solar system. And the WHOI is actually uh, working with NASA and taking their knowledge of our oceans here on Earth to apply them to the oceans in space. Yes, that's right. I said oceans in space. So ocean worlds are defined as a group of planetary bodies in our outer solar system known to have liquid oceans. Um, so they're described to having rocky seafloors like we do here on Earth. And there's a possibility that they may be able to support and sustain life similar to what we find here in our oceans on Earth. So deep sea exploration that's occurring underwater and on the water here is now being taken beyond into space and studying what the water and liquid life of planets and moons out in the um, farther in the solar system, seeing how they are similar, how they are different. If they are similar, how can we utilize their resources? How can we uh, maintain their resources if they're in trouble as oceans can often uh, become I, I don't want to go too far into it, but with various pollutions and things in our in our atmosphere and other elements, our ocean waters can become contaminated, sea levels change, they rise and fall, and they can affect uh, various life on Earth. So we are trying to understand all of that. We are taking our knowledge of our oceans here and taking them into space. And hopefully once we learn a little bit more about each of these places, we can see how we can apply that knowledge to keeping and protecting all of it safe and exploring more of what is out there. Now, unfortunately, NASA hasn't proven or if they have proven that there's additional life or aliens in space, uh, they have not shared that with us. We do know, however, there are some pretty unique looking sea creatures that live in the ocean deep. These are just a couple. They live in some of the harshest environments on our planet. Um, you've got the Dumbo octopus on the left, the comb jellyfish in the center, and the big fin reef squid on the right. Um, 
the Dumbo octopus actually kind of looks a little cute. Um, so does the big fin reef squid. And the cone jellyfish in the center there uh, uses something called bioluminescence, which essentially means it can produce light. Again, in the deepest parts of the ocean, it is extremely dark. Um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what all of the, the bioluminescence is for. Some people believe it might be for mating. A lot of times it's just part of their anatomy, seeing, navigating in the deep, dark waters. But one thing to keep in mind is that the farther you go, the darker it does get, and the darker it gets, oftentimes things can get a little more scary. So these are a couple of other deep sea creatures that are alien-like in their look. And although they look a little scary, they're actually not as big as you would think. More importantly, you're not going to encounter any of these in person uh, as they live way, 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 way uh, down at the bottom of the ocean. The only time you would encounter it is if you are in one of those submersible vehicles in which case you are safely inside anyway, so you do not have to worry about any of these creatures nibbling at you or doing anything. When it comes to sea and space exploration, there's so much to it. There's so much that I wasn't able to cover just in this short amount of time. And more importantly, it's changing every day. Um, with new missions to space occurring and new underwater missions happening on a daily and hourly basis, all of the things that the scientists and researchers are learning are just completely changing what we know about the planet we live on, uh, the waters that encompass that planet, and the space and solar system we live in. Um, despite the fact that our planet is 75% water, we really only have studied about 5% of the deepest parts of our ocean. And in space, despite the fact that we have sent many people into space, have been to the moon, have sent things like the Mars rover to other planets, we have the Hubble telescope, we really only know and have explored only about 4% of space. So that means there is still so much out there for us to learn about and continue exploring. Um, I'm really excited to see what comes next. All of these space missions, again, February 18th, 2021, I have already marked it on my calendar to see what it looks like when the Mars rover Percy lands on Mars and begins its work there. Um, so essentially, these are two very amazing spaces that are both similar and different and have a lot to offer in our understanding of our planet and everything that surrounds us. Um, I wish I could sit here and talk to you about every aspect of it because there's so much, um, but I hope this kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that have already happened and how we are looking into the future for both of these areas. What I have included here is a list of various resources, um, some pages to a lot of those websites that I mentioned in organizations like NASA and NOAA. Um, I was not able to do it as a downloadable document, so I'll give it a second here if anybody would like to screenshot it. Also, in just a minute here, my email contact information will be available. And if you would like me to send any or this entire list to you um, personally or specifically, please do not hesitate to ask. There are some great resources, including that um, Mars Perseverance rover website that I showed you. And with that, I will go ahead and open it up to any questions and answer them to the best of my abilities here. Uh, uh, and before I do, thank you all for spending your time with me today. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the program. Um, and as I said, I'll go ahead and answer some questions. Erica, we got a couple here. Um, one says, you said the Apollo 13 crew holds the record for the furthest travel from Earth uh, would this not be true for all of the Apollo crews? Um, I would have to double check that. I know in all of the research that I 
looked at, this is the one that came up the most in terms of uh, how far away they were. I can absolutely double check and look and see, but again, they were initially heading to the moon and the moon is about 255,000 miles away when it's at its farthest point. So depending on how far or where the moon was in position when some of those other crews uh, went out into space and everything or where they went to uh, could determine that distance and how far out they actually were. Remember correctly, they they had to orbit a couple more times than was yeah. scheduled. So that's yeah, probably they were, what's adding to the total. And that's a possibility too as well. Awesome. Um, okay, so we have another question here. Uh, is Are there any physiologically are there any physiological differences between male and female uh, aquanauts or? Um, so I guess so, physical constraints or <laughs> yeah, yeah, differences no. really. Absolutely, that's a really good question. Um, so I actually did research on the Tech Type Project um, a couple years ago. And again, the study took place in the 70s when uh, trying to be as delicate as possible, but um, again, this was a man's world at the time. So they described the women at oftentimes being more cranky. Um, they alluded that to them being female versus male um, and just the stereotype, for lack of a better term, of, you know, uh, how we operate in terms of emotion. Overall, over time, there's very little physio uh, physi physiological difference. Women did tend to lose a little bit more weight. Men tend to lose a little bit more of their overall muscle mass, however. So there are some differences to that, um, to that and I think that's an absolutely great question that you asked. So the answer in layman's terms is yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, here's another one. Um, so, Erica, both are fascinating worlds. Which one would you want to explore and why? Oh, uh, I would love to explore them both. However, I would probably take the opportunity to go to the, the ocean first um, because the idea of being shot uh, into space at 18,000 miles per hour on a giant rocket uh, is is not my favorite thought. I fly fairly frequently, or I did um, before the pandemic, and unfortunately, I get vertigo, and so it's never a fun experience. So I can only imagine what the atmosphere of space and everything would do to me. So if I had to choose, I think I'll start with deep ocean exploration and then maybe work my way up, 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 up. <laughs> I mean, that's a great, it's a great reason. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let's check over here. Um, all right. Well, that looks like all the questions that we have today. All right. Well, again, here's my contact information. If anybody does think of anything or do want some more uh, resources on any of these topics, um, and please feel free to visit us at marinersmuseum.org. We have a lot of information, including our catalog, where you can. Uh, explore more items in our collection, mostly into underwater uh, research and exploration as we are a maritime institution. Uh, but with that, thank you everybody who uh, has been with me for this past hour. I hope you enjoyed the program and have a great rest of your day. Great. Thank you again, Erica.